Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinges looks at a tough perennial with prolific flower production. We build a spiral mound garden that creates a striking way to successfully grow herbs. OSU entomologist Andrina Shufran introduces us to a unique pest control. We have a fun kids garden project. And Barbara Brown cooks pasta puttanesca. another Oklahoma proven perennial that we want to showcase today. This is cat mint or this particular cultivar is Walker's low cat mint and you can see it forms about a one to two foot tall clump. Um, it is a very nice mounding perennial that puts on a lovely flush of lavender blue flowers in the springtime. Now if we trim these back after they flush out this first time we'll continue to get flowers throughout the season. You can see by the abundance of bees on here, they're great pollinator plants as well. This plant does really well in mass, or as you can see here, as a nice border plant. It also works well in a great herb garden or rock garden. It does prefer full sun, but can handle a little bit of shade. Now down in the deep south, it can't handle the hot humidity, so you might see it suffer a little bit. It likes drier conditions, as it prefers drier soil conditions as well. Now this Nepeta, or cat mint, is related. It's the same genus as that cat mint that might excite your cat, but it is actually a different species. While this isn't the same species that will get your cat excited, it's one that all gardeners should get excited about. No garden is complete without adding a few herbs and we've got a fun decorative way to add those herbs into your garden. Try building a spiral herb garden or an herb spiral. The idea is that you create this six foot diameter spiral that mounds towards the center. The center of course has a lot more drainage in it because of gravity plus adding and amending that soil as well. So you're able to plant more Mediterranean plants in the center and then as we work down the spiral you're incorporating more water-loving herbs. It's a great way to add some versatility to your herb garden. The first thing that we want to do since we're building this on existing crushed granite is to protect that granite so that our soil doesn't penetrate and mess up our area in case this garden is ever removed. Now we could use heavy landscape fabric um, if we wanted to, but we actually came across a six foot diameter smart pot that we're going to use. Now the smart pot typically has you can see has a higher wall to it so what we're going to do is fold in that wall a little bit just because we don't want our uh, spiral mound wall to have to be as tall as this container is. As you're laying out your either landscape fabric or your smart pot if you have pre-existing irrigation you want to make sure that you go ahead and pipe that in at this point. We had some existing drip irrigation and so we just cut a slit in our smart pot through the liner and pulled that drip irrigation up and so that it's contained inside our garden for us to continue to use that irrigation. After laying out our smart pot, we're going to start building our dry stack stone on the outside of it so we won't really see that lining at all. Now we're using just some old leftover um, flagstone. Really the nice thing about this is you can use whatever sort of hard scape material you might have laying around. You could use bricks, you could use pavers. Like I said, we're using this stone here. 
Um, so we're going to start just layering this and what we found to be the best is to actually put one layer all the way around the circumference and just keep layering it. And of course you want to do it in a brick laying fashion so that each layer overlaps the breaks of the stone below it. As you're building your wall, you also might find that it helps to put a little bit of soil on the inside of the garden to kind of reinforce that backside and stabilize it a little bit. Now before you put too much soil in there, we've got to start thinking about where our spiral wall is going to be built. So using some chalk, we have drawn out where our spiral is going to be. Um, and again, if you're running short on matching stone, the first couple of layers that you're putting on your spiral can be a different type of rock or paver um, because that's not going to be seen. It's going to be covered up with soil. So, But you want to go ahead and start that process again as you're building your exterior wall if you're starting to fill it with some soil. And then the other thing is, is that again we're creating a mound garden so the center is going to be probably about twice the height of the exterior wall. So you want to keep that in mind. Just because the outside wall might not be that high, the inside wall will be higher. Now, this is the time to kind of step back at the garden that you've built and take a look at it and make sure that you're satisfied with the layout and the spiral, the symmetry of it, um, and to do any tweaks that you might want to do. Also to kind of check those rocks and make sure that they're fairly stable. Um, again, just for you as a homeowner to maybe make sure that they're safe for you to be on. So now at this point, you can see we still have to put some more soil in here. And this is the time that we're going to start amending some of that soil. So we've got a couple of different products over here. Again, for the top of the center, that's where our drought tolerant herbs are going to be. So we're going to incorporate both some sand and then also some just chicken grit. Um, and both of these products are really going to enhance the drainage of the center of our herb garden. So we'll go ahead and mix some of this in. As we come down around the spiral, we're getting into just more soil and compost. And then finally, of course, we've got our bog garden at the bottom that's really going to hold all that moisture. All of this is going to make three different microclimates for us to plant in. Now that we've got our herb spiral built and filled with the different types of soil, we're going to start incorporating our plants. And so you can see here we've started in the center. Of course, it's easier to start planting in the center before you get the outside planted. Um, and what we've got here are some Mediterranean or drought heat loving herbs. Um, because we've mixed in the grit and the sand, it's going to drain faster. Also, because it's upright and mounded here, it also gravity will naturally drain it faster. Furthermore, because it is surrounded by more hardscape, we're going to heat those roots up a little bit more as well. So again, the Mediterranean herbs work really well for the center of your garden. So some of the plants that we're incorporating up here into this hotter area are some lavender, rosemary, curry, and sage. Um, and you can see here that a lot of these have more of that silver or blue-green foliage look to them. And that's because that's a natural thing that a lot of plants that are growing in heat or drought conditions have because it actually helps retain that moisture in the plant. So again, it adds a little color to the garden and we're going to go ahead and get these planted. So now we have our second layer of herbs laid out and you can see these herbs are definitely more green. They've got some variegation. We've got bronze fennel in here. We've also got a lemon sculpture geranium which adds some interesting texture to the garden as well. We've incorporated parsley, some alliums or chives. Um, we've got some also some basil purple basil and then we put some creeping thyme in here as well and those are kind of nice just to help soften the edges of that hardscape. Now as we get down here you might be wondering about this particular pot. This is new to our um, spiral mound garden and that's because this is a mint and if you've ever grown mint you know how aggressive it can be. We wanted to incorporate some mint um, but we're going to use a pot that doesn't have any holes and what we're going to do is just dig this into the ground here, our soil. And we're going to make sure that lip stays above the actual soil line so that it doesn't creep over. We're going to fill it with some of this soil as well around it and plant our mint directly in that pot. That way it stays contained and doesn't take over our whole spiral mound garden. 
So finally down here in our bog garden where we're going to plant some herbs, we, we were a little loose with our definition of herbs. So we've got a hibiscus here. Now there are tea hibiscus that you can incorporate, but a lot of hibiscus enjoy having uh, a wetter condition. We also have a taro here, which of course um, you can harvest the roots from taro uh, for a product, a crop. Um, and then we have some Corsican mint that we're going to plant. And this particular mint does like more wet conditions. Um, now some other plants you might incorporate or something like bee balm and monarda. Um, those also do well in wetter conditions that would be appropriate for the bottom of your spiral mound garden. So now you can see we've got it all planted and we've got it packed full of herbs, but can you ever have too many herbs in your garden? One thing about this, when I mentioned it's like a linear garden, but it's wrapped up into a spiral, we actually measured the linear uh, distance of this and it's about 18 and a half feet. We also measured the width of the garden bed, which is about 10 inches. So that gives us 180 square feet of planting space that's less than a six foot diameter bed here. Now typically a spiral mound garden is six foot in diameter, just like our keyhole gardens, because that's the ideal depth at which you can still reach from the outside into the center to harvest it. So again, another option to create a microclimate for different herbs and it's decorative as well. Now we just need to water it in and wash off some of this excess soil. Hello, we're here today at the Insect Adventure Greenhouses where we grow all of our plants to feed to all of our walking sticks year round so that we have lots of bugs to play with. And for years, thank you. And for years we've had problems. A greenhouse is a perfect situation for pests to build up to a level where it's very expensive to maintain them and keep them under control. And so we were joking one day, we have grasshoppers, we have walking sticks in here. Why don't we just get a chicken? And after we talked about it and thought about it, we had a young woman who donated two male roosters with big furry feet to live in our greenhouse year round and eat all of our pests. In the past, one vial of good bugs, beneficial lady beetles or lacewing, this jar can cost as much as $185. And it'll work well, but once all the aphids die, then there's nothing for your natural enemies to eat. These guys work year round, day round, and all they require is a bag of chicken feet. It also, it also gives back in other ways. One is our students who need to maintain this greenhouse are always wanting to come out and enjoy the chickens and see them and watch them work as they eat the grasshoppers. And the students like to notice that everything is getting better and they're not having to spend a bunch of money. And if people are out in their environment, more often they're gonna notice when problems happen, when things go bad, when water isn't working. You'll notice problems if you're experiencing them every day, which in the past, the greenhouse kind of fence for itself. And the best part about having chickens is it's the best kind of fertilizer you can give to plants and it's free. <laughs> Today we're going to do a craft that involves potatoes. It's actually a fun little craft you can do on those dreary winter days. It'll make 
make everything a little bit of fun and you're having fun with plants, which is the whole purpose of the horticulture program. So we're just gonna take your standard potato that you can get in five pound bags at your grocery store. And we're gonna cut it, kind of cube it into like cheese, fruit and cheese plate sized cheese blocks into somewhat small pieces, no bigger than a block of cheese on a fruit and cheese plate. You're going to stick a toothpick right through the middle of it. Being careful not to poke yourself. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna let it dehydrate. So you can use a food dehydrator or you can just stick it out in the air. I find that if you have it on a styrofoam plate, the air comes around from all sides and dries it pretty nicely, although it might take a couple weeks. One thing you do wanna do so that the potato doesn't stick on the toothpick too much is every couple days, just kinda of spin it so the starch doesn't glue the potato on there. So it's easier to take off when it's dried. All right, so after they've dried completely, then you have dehydrated potatoes on a stick. So what you do with those is you paint them. So you can spray paint them. I've used tempera paint. I've used acrylic paint. And all you have to do, since they're on a handy little stick, is you just take them off. You just get some paint. Make sure you get all the sides. So use your imagination on the colors. But again, you wanna make sure you paint tops, bottoms, all the sides. And depending on what kind of paint you use, it'll dry in a couple hours, maybe less. And so what you can do with them is after they're done, you slide them off the toothpick. And the really neat thing is the hole that it leaves is just the right size for the little rubber lanyards, little rubber pieces you can get at a craft store. So you can string them on there just like so. And the little rubber strings come in different colors so you can mix and match for whatever colors you painted your potato pieces. So if you've spun the potatoes while they were drying so they don't completely stick to the toothpick, it'll be pretty easy to get them off. So now you have some potatoes on a stick, on a, on a rubber string now, so you can use it as a bracelet. You can get a whole bunch and make a necklace. You can put them as close together as you want. You could also put plastic beads between them or anything you want. You could have a couple charms hanging down out of the middle. But it's a neat little way to use something you have around the house anyway, something that's not that expensive, to make a little craft you can wear or give as a gift. Today we're going to do pasta puttanesca with olives. It's really fairly easy. It takes uh, maybe about a half an hour, but you can do it ahead of time, or at least uh, do some parts of it ahead of time. But you can make the sauce a day or two ahead. Like all uh, tomato sauces, it tends to develop some flavor as it goes along. So I've got a large pan uh, because I want some evaporation so the sauce will thicken a little bit. I'm going to add two tablespoons of, of olive oil to it. You could use canola oil or another type. Uh, make sure it's uh, a little bit toasty. The pan was good and hot, so it's ready to go. And then I've got about a half a cup of chopped onion. And we're going to just put it in here, stir it around a little bit, and then we're going to let it simmer uh, for about five minutes, uh, just until it gets a little bit translucent. All right, you can see how the onion has mellowed out there. It's gotten a little translucent. It looks beautiful, but it's not browned, which is our goal. We'll have, so have the heat on low enough. What I have here uh, are four cloves of garlic. If you're using a commercial minced uh, garlic, then that'd be about four teaspoons of garlic. So there's a lot of garlic here for the uh, number of uh, servings you're going to end up with. But that's going to add a lot of flavor to it as well. 
the little green is a little bit of uh, mint that was in the in the cup that I used. So don't panic, we won't be tasting that later. Uh, and it's not because I didn't get the garlic all the way cleaned either. So this is gonna cook for about a minute, uh, 30 seconds to a minute. You don't want the garlic to brown. So I'm gonna go ahead and add a 28 ounce can or a quart if you've done them yourself of petite diced or diced tomatoes. If you don't have either of those, you can use whole tomatoes. Just make sure you break them up into small pieces. Interesting thing about the tomatoes that you buy commercially, if they're petite diced, they're going to have, if they're diced tomatoes, they're going to have more uh, calcium in the can uh, than they will if they're whole tomatoes or crushed tomatoes. And so they're going to hold their shape. So you use the diced tomatoes when you still want to see a dice later on. If you don't want to see a dice in them, as I really don't want to see one here particularly, uh, then you'd use one that's going to have less calcium in it. All of them commercially will have some. It helps the tomato hold its shape. Now also into this we're going to add a half a cup of olives that have just been coarsely chopped. I'm using Kalamata olives. If you've got um, mixed olives, say you've gone to the market and you saw they had an olive bar, this would be a great time to try out some of those. Uh, just make sure of course you pit them in the process so that nobody gets that surprise uh, bit like the cherry pie. There's always seems to be one seed left in that. I've also got a tablespoon of capers and two tablespoons of tomato paste, which we'll try and get in there. These are all going to stir together and then we're going to let it simmer together uh, so that the flavors have a chance to uh, blend and for about 20 minutes before we move on to the next stage. And then also I'm going to add, um, let me see, half a teaspoon of red pepper flakes. And this one, depending on how daring you are, uh, you can go up or down with. And you may want to just let it simmer with this amount for a while, and then you could boost it with a little more pepper towards the end uh, because the, the pepper flavors will mellow out over time. And again, bring it up to a boil, then reduce it and let it simmer for about 20 minutes. Now in the meantime, while that is cooking, we've got a pot of hot water here, and I'm not going to add the pasta to it yet. I'm going to use a, uh, either a, use a whole wheat pasta or a multi-grain pasta or one with a protein boost as opposed to the plain pasta, and that's just going to add a little bit more nutrition to, your, to the meal, uh, so that's a good thing to do there. But I don't want to overcook it. It needs to cook somewhere between 10 to 12 minutes usually for spaghetti, which is what I'm going to use. You could use linguine. You could use any kind of pasta that you have. Uh, uh, but just make sure that you don't start it so early that it's ready and being held uh, and you're waiting on the sauce to finish cooking. So I'm going to give it, uh, since this is, is 20 minutes and it could go a little bit longer, I'm going to wait till we're about 10 minutes left on this and then I'm going to start the pasta. Whenever you cook pasta, it's a good idea to save some of the pasta water, even if you don't need it later on, uh, to help thin the sauce out. Uh, often what I find is that it, I don't eat all the pasta on the first day, so I have the pasta mixed with the sauce, and on the second day, it's gotten a little bit too thick, and just using water isn't as useful. But if I have some of the sauce, it's got some of the starch in it as well, and so it does a real nice job of uh, thinning down the sauce on the pasta or the, the sauce itself. So let me grab my pot holders. We're going to drain the pasta now that we've saved some of the liquid and then we'll go back over and, and check on the on the sauce itself now what can happen here is you can go one of two ways uh, you can either put the pasta back in the big pot and then uh, mix everything together with the sauce I'm going to do it uh, a little bit different way in that I'm going to put some of the pasta on the plate and then I'm going to put the sauce over it. Now, if you do this on a platter, that's fine. That works great. Uh, and that's probably enough for a serving. I've got a few of the actual olives here reserved. And we'll put a little bit of sauce over the top. And that if you want to, uh, you can put a little bit of Parmesan cheese on top of this or a little bit of basil. Now you could shred the basil, do a chiffonade. I'm just going to put a, a sprig of basil over the top of it. And then the, the last thing that I'm going to do is I've got some toasted walnuts. And we're going to sprinkle those around as well. Now this adds uh, some texture that you wouldn't have otherwise. But the other nice thing it does is it adds a lot of protein and some additional flavor. So just uh, toast the nuts up in a skillet for a little bit. Uh, and it... Uh, 
really boosts everything about this dish. It makes it really, really special. You could use other nuts as well. I've used uh, well, walnuts on this one. I hope you'll give it a try. For Oklahoma Gardening, this is Barbara Brown, and this is Pasta Putanesca with Olives. There are lots of great horticultural events this time of year. Be sure and consider these activities when you're making your plans for the weeks ahead. Next week, we have an iris that keeps looking great long after the blooms are gone. In Ames, Iowa, we stop by the Ryman Gardens on the campus of Iowa State University to find out how All-American selections are trialed and visit their butterfly house. Back home, Casey builds a butterfly-themed yard decoration, and we count Japanese beetles. We hope you join us then for more TV You'll Grow to Love. To find out more information about show topics, as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local extension offices, be sure and visit our website, oklamagardening.okstate.edu. And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club.